Hi there, eighth graders, and welcome to the end of the week. It is week three, lesson five. We've made it yet another week. Um, goodness, next week, we'll, uh, at the end, will be a month that we've done this, and we've been doing pretty well for ourselves. So good job, keep it up. And if you're starting to fall behind, pick it up, pick up the pace, because I don't want you to not be ready for high school, because this is where all of it's leading. So, all right. So today we work more on our paper, but first, of course, we're going to start off on the right note with our meditation. All right. So again, another beautiful image we have here of the cross and a beautiful verse that goes with it. I think a lot of you have told me that it's one of your favorite verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that, of course, is John 3.16. This is a great one, as all of them are. And you know, again, there's not any bad ones. But this one is, again, real poignant. Of course, not only did we just celebrate recently the death and resurrection of our Lord and the conquering of death and victory for us all through Christ. But in a time like this, when there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of confusion, a lot of worry and illness, to remember that it's not about this temporal life, this temporary life on earth. It's about our eternal life. And whatever happens, putting our hope, faith, love in Christ, the conqueror of death, we shall not perish, but have eternal life. And that's something to cling to and to remember and to give God the glory for. Let's remember to do that, boys and girls. All right, let us pray together. Please focus. Almighty and merciful God, we most humbly and heartily thank your divine majesty for your loving kindness and tender mercies, that you have heard our humble prayers and graciously granted us protection from our troubles and misery. We pray to you to continue granting your helping grace that we may lead lives pleasing to you, that we may continually offer to you a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And hear, O Lord, the prayers of your servants for the coronavirus to be eradicated and for the people who have contracted it to get better, including Karina's neighbor. For our healthcare workers who work with those infected with this disease, for people in hospitals or nursing homes who cannot have their families uh, visit them, for all essential workers who are at greater risk of exposure to COVID-19, and for our families to get along and for everyone to have the essentials they need. All this we surrender to you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. All right, so let me get out of that. Stop sharing for that because we have a whole lot of sharing today. And let me get to that. Let's see. Here we go. And I will be sending you the link to this website. It's a great one. Uh, the OWL, it's the online writing lab uh, at Purdue great source all the way from now to high school to the collegiate level. Trust me, been there, done that. Not just the MLA that you're doing, but the APA format as well. Uh, I was one of the lucky ones, and I put lucky in those quotes, um, people that got to do both in my particular discipline. The science side of communication studies uses APA formatting, and the rhetoric side uses the MLA. And I even had a professor that used one other, so <laughs> it was an adventure for me. So again, you have what you need. It's easy peasy because you've got all the information you need on those source cards. You had to have had three. You may have more eventually because you have more sources. But now just taking that information you've already got down and putting it in the right format, which is what we're working on here. So the basics. Each entry in the list of works cited, which is like a bibliography, is made up of core elements given in a specific order. The core elements should be listed in the order in which they appear on the side here, which we'll be going over in a moment, and each element is followed by the punctuation mark shown here, and that's the following slides. And again, it's going to be much more streamlined than it used to be. This is the eighth edition, so they keep improving and making it better. All right, so author makes sense when it has an author. You've already found some of your sources don't have authors, so then we'll work with that. You'll see some examples. Title of the source, title of the container, if it's a smaller source, if it's in something larger, like a chapter, you're only using a chapter out of an entire book, things like that. Other contributors, like editors, things like that, you'll see. They all get credit because they were part of it. Version, if there's more than one version of that kind of source. 
number, if it's a series of some sort, like a, a whole set of books. Publisher, who produced it, publication date, when it was produced, and location. The whole idea behind a works cited page is for the reader to either, in a teacher's case, check your work, make sure these are valid sources and you're not plagiarizing and you've got everything you need, all that kind of good stuff, but also for a reader to say, hey, this was really good, but I want more. There's more information out there. I just know it. Where did you get this information? And so they check it out for more details. So again, have it as detailed as possible, starting with the author. And again, it's going to be last name first, first name, and then if there's an initial for the middle name or a middle name, you can include that. And um, it punctuated just like you say. So just like that, obviously B comes before J. So this entry, Baron Naomi, comes before Jacobs Allen. And we'll get to the other parts in the next slide. Second is the title source. So here you again, you see the author's last name, first name, author's last name, first name. But here you have so many books. It's now it's a, in this case, it's a book or a large volume. It's in italics. And you see that it's on a, a website, a blog in this case. Here again, it's in italics. So it's a larger volume. But if you have something shorter, like a periodical, a magazine, um, uh, could be a newspaper article, that kind of thing. Smaller, it's gonna be a getting quotation marks, which I think you've learned that before when we've talked about the mechanics of the English language. So nothing new there. The title of the container, so the, whatever larger it's in. For example, here, there's a section of this book they just use toward uh, meta reading. So that's in the quotation marks, the smaller uh, scale. The larger is afterward, the future of the book, and so you have it next to it. Um, but again, you notice that it's still author first, uh, by last name, then first name, then the title, and then the container it was in. All right, moving along to other contributors. So again, give credit where credit is due. In this particular example, this first one, there is a translator. Lydia G. Cochran is a translator. She's the one that makes it so that more people can read it in their own language. So she gets included in that after all those first things we've done the author, the title, there's a, there's a volume, all that kind of stuff we just talked about. And including down here, it's not necessarily what you'll be using because you'll be using sources like books and websites. But if you were doing a report in the arts or something and you had an episode from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Slayer as this one has, you would um, include the performance by Sarah Michelle Gellar because she gets the credit as well. It's largely her. Next one is the version. So there can be different editions and versions. You see that a lot in our textbooks. They're always making it new and improved. So there's new editions like you see in the second example or number one bestseller of all time is the Bible and there's plenty of versions out there. <laughs> so you need to make sure you notate that at, at what version is. In this case, it's the authorized King James Version. Note that there's no, uh, there's no authors here because there's way too many. The Bible is a, a set of books in, in one. So then the, uh, there are also thus a lot of different authors. But again, the version is important. All right, and oh, on the note of additions, when you're doing future research especially and you get to higher levels, you should always use the most recent edition because it's, the newest editions are for improvements, accuracy, uh, things that have changed over time, what have you, so that you need to use the newest edition. And then the number. If a source is part of a numbered sequence, such as a multi-volume -vol book, or journals with multiple volumes, you need to notate that. So again, you can narrow it down when someone is searching for what you found, where you found your information. And you see that here, volume 128, number one. My husband's quite the theologian and has lots of these kinds of books, some beautiful sets that are numbered, some of them with Roman numerals, some of them with regular numbers, all that kind of stuff. You need to include that. And then also then goes down to the, our publisher. So who produced or distributed the source? So sometimes with a book, it'll be an actual publisher. Other times with a, a, a website, you just need to be very detailed in um, who's putting it out. Like I think one of you mentioned that you got it from PBS um, or, or history.org or something like that. You want to be specific and give credit to um, who produced it, who distributed it, all right? And then the publication date, so the when. 
The source may have been published on more than one date, such as an online version of an original source. So you need to use the date that is most relevant to what you're using. So for example, here, this first example, painting by the numbers, all right. Um, it's spring of 2008. Here, we have, again, see how they narrowed it down to season four? We have it 1999, so that's gonna tell us when that was made. And last but not least, getting down to the real specific location, and that would be like we talked about page numbers. You want to include those if it's a book, whether it's an online book or a physical book. Um, if it's just a website, then see how detailed this URL is? I'd be able to click that and go right to the site where you got your information. That's the kind of detail that you need to include. So that gives you an idea of what needs to be included. That's what you are taking on your source cards is the kind of information you would need to now make a site's, uh, a work site's page. So a couple of the other things I wanted to share with you. So let me stop sharing there and share screen with the, I created this source for you. A basic research paper guidelines. The first part's gonna be great. I advise you to download this, save it in a file on your computer or print it out. You'll be wanting to refer to this a lot, not try to remember which Google um, entry it's, uh, it was posted in. So you wanna download that or print it out. But down here is what you're gonna be focusing on for this lesson because this is what you're gonna be doing is making a rough draft of your work cited page. Why do I say rough draft? Because it's going to change. I, it, it definitely will. Unless you have done a lot, a lot of legwork already, you may find that you, one source you were using, I gotta check it, because it's just not all that. You decide to get a different one, or you add something, because you're not finding enough information in the three sources that you have. So it's gonna be a work in progress. But this way, you turn it in, I can see that you've got the idea, and we can go from there. So be looking at this for all of the uh, font size, the, the type of font, the margin, uh, parameters, all of the details that you'll need to pay attention to. Strict attention, because you don't want to lose points for silly things like that when uh, you're taking away from your overall grade. I want to have to be, want to be grading the content, not all that silly stuff. And it's not so silly because it gets drilled into you all through high school and then college as well. Must, must, must follow this MLA styling. And then down below, it also even has a page you can look at for an example. On that note, there are, there's another, um, let me go back to screen sharing, source that I ha will have posted for you. And that's just been here. I like this particular, even though we used the seventh edition and now we're already on the eighth edition. Um, the site that I give you at the OWL will give you more up to date, but this is good because it's just compact. It's not as comprehensive as going to that huge website, but it shows you with one author what to do, with more than uh, one author what to do, what to do with an encyclopedia, a magazine, a newspaper, a website. You'll use that a lot. So there's some examples um, here for what you'll do. So those things will all be posted and then all you're going to do is type up a page it just you've just got three sources that you're required to do now if you have more already and want to include them so you can already have me give it a look and see how you're doing understanding the formatting and whatnot great you can do that it's not required but you can indeed do that and then we'll go from there be sure to check it all out make sure that everything's there because i forgot something you can remind me in our live zoom class and bring your questions so that we can get you all getting going. And remember, we're not writing a paper. This is just a rough draft of the works side of page. Not until we go over the outline and do one will then it be a good time to start writing. But you can certainly continue to take notes on your note cards because more of those will be due as we go along and you can get ahead if you'd like. All right, take care, have a fabulous weekend and I'll see you on Monday.